Okay, what is up, everybody? It's your man, Big Dog Lukey, and I'm here with a legend, uh, a pioneer, Kalisha West. It is an honor that, A, you remembered me, and, B, that you are here talking with me. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> of course. You know? Um, some names some names stand out. <laughs> well, I'm glad that I stood out to you because you've always stood out to me. You're, in my opinion, you're a legendary fighter. And you're also a a mother and a strong person. And I think that that, on top of being a great fighter, you're a great person. And that needs to be documented as well. I appreciate that. You know what I'd like to, I'd like to piggyback off that. I wouldn't be, you know, the strong person and character that I am today if it weren't for boxing. As a matter of fact, if you look at one of the most recent interviews that I – it's not recent in time – but recent in in being released that I posted on my Twitter account, it was an interview of me when I was like 14 years old, 15 years old. And, and, and I sound so modest and shy, like a little old kid, but I had no confidence back then. And I lost a lot more fights than I, you know, wanted to as an amateur. And I didn't start winning until I became pro. So for the most part, it was very humbling and then, you know, once you once you get it down and you start winning fights, you just start getting real confident in life. Not just the ring, but in life. You know you understand what I'm saying? So it's like I appreciate that and I appreciate how you recognize that because it all it's it's with all due uh, you know, uh, it's all thanks to sport of boxing, ultimately. Well let's let's start where it began and I'm sure everyone always kinda of does the same stuff. But I'm going to try to do it much more cooler and more honoring your career, so we're going to try to do it. But let's talk about, like, your amateur career, how you got into it, and kind of the hardship you faced as an amateur. Like you were just saying, that you weren't always getting your hand raised. What was your amateur career like, and why? Were you, why how did you get into this? I got into it because of my father being a coach, and – he was, you know, he was my inspiration. I looked up to him. I really wanted to be around what he was around. He's just a real funny guy. He's a he's a kid's best friend. His personality is just so uh, elaborate. And and so I got into it because of him. Um, but as an amateur, you know, my dad, me being his daughter, and I get it now because I'm a mom. I, d- I, would, I didn't get it as a child, but I get it now. You know, as an amateur, everything that happens in my career is – completely you know it, it's it's completely um emo- it's very emotional so everything is going to be uh, it's more enhanced whether you know if i lose if i win if i'm getting ready for my fight his emotions are more enhanced not not discrediting any other fighter because he treated all of his fighters as his own as his own kids as his own children that's how passionate he was about it but with my career i wasn't i wasn't the political favorite because of because of uh a, a um, personal preference in the politics. My dad wasn't afraid to speak. He wasn't afraid to share his opinion. He wasn't afraid to say, you know, that's messed up or that's wrong or that wasn't a fair decision. He was not afraid to voice, you know, what he felt was unfair. So going into these fights, it was one of those, oh, another one of, you know, West fighters who were always so talented, which made us better because we knew we had to beat the other person's ass excuse the language, we had to beat them up really bad to get the victory. That's how we all, uh, most of us felt. You know what I mean? That's just how most of us felt. So as an amateur, you know, be, me being this shy, modest person who, you know, was too embarrassed to even speak, had a crooked smile, I was so quiet. And then I've got my dad who, who, who speaks for me, you know, lives through me, and he is the voice behind me. And, and it's like, for I just wasn't really a fan favorite. <laughs> I, I really wasn't. I didn't have a voice for myself yet. I was really young, but I kept doing it, and that's the difference between me and a lot of these girls. A lot of these girls that I was fighting were up against. They quit, or they stopped, or, or they, you know, they didn't continue. But I just, I kept doing it, you know. Well, I've got so many different questions that come from that, but I got almost one that's like an outside of boxing uh, thing where, when I was in my teenage years. Uh, I had a lot of self-confidence issues and boxing helped me and team sports helped me and my neighborhood helped me and I I became this dope individual that I believe I am. 
but I feel like there's a lot of pressures on women around confidence and feeling comfortable, especially in their teenage years. Did boxing may help you uh, become more confident as a young woman outside of the boxing ring where you felt like you could voice yourself or be who you wanted to be because of the sport and during this transitionary period in your life? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, that's why I always tell parents who are interested in getting their daughters into a, a, a contact sport like boxing, especially boxing, I always, always tell them, I say, it ain't going to do nothing but good for them because in, in boxing you have you have to learn the art of discipline, the art of, of earning respect. So th- what you do to earn your respect makes you never want to be disrespected again, you understand? In other words, in other words, it'll take it'll take a thousand ass whoopings if it takes a thousand ass whoopings to get in there and finally turn around and get a victory and win. What you did to get there makes you never want never want to go back to disrespect. So in the real world, when you meet somebody who's disrespectful, you have a whole you have a whole different idea of what type of person is able to be disrespectful. So your idea of a person, you know, who's who's not respecting you is somebody who's tough and macho and strong and, and disciplined. That's just your natural idea of what that looks like. So if you got Joe Schmuckatelli in the real world who's disrespecting you, then you're just like, nah, I ain't standing for this. You know, it just it just creates this, a totally different mindset of what you what you tolerate in the real world, in a relationship, in a job, in life, in your friendships, you, you begin to not tolerate, you know, what you may have tolerated if you didn't have the confidence that you gained from boxing. Not only that, but one thing that it, it really taught me was discipline. Huge, huge, huge thing. You know, now that I'm now that I'm 32, retired, I have I have a, a, a son and I'm engaged, and I could pick up and go to Vegas tomorrow if I want to. But when I when I was boxing. And when I was active, I knew if I went out one night, I could have a boat whoop for two weeks. One night would cause me a setback in the gym for, for two weeks. You understand what I'm saying? And oh, because I of know. that. Yeah, because, exactly. And because of that mentality, my whole career, you know, it was, in, it was just driven. It was just drive. And it was uh, instilled in me. Because of that, in the real world, I look at myself and I think I'm lazy. And I'm working a full-time job, raising my son, working out every now and then, and I'm in school pursuing an education to get a bachelor's degree in nursing because I want to eventually do forensic science. But see, right now, today, I feel like I'm lazy, and I feel like I can do more. And it sounds crazy, but it's because the level of discipline that you learn in boxing when you have to lose a certain amount of, of pounds by a certain weight, but then you also still got to maintain your daily you know, your daily resume and you still got to get eight hours of sleep. You got to spar twice a week. You got to go to gym six days a week. You got to work out three times a week, uh, three, three hours a day. And then you got to uh, go running at least five times a week, you know, for six months straight until you get up to that fight. Then you got to travel and you got to prepare, you know, mentally. It's like when you put yourself through something like that in the real world, it makes you so much harder on yourself in everything that you do. That's why if, for me, I can't just settle I can't just settle for a day in, day out job. I want to go get my bachelor's now that I'm not boxing. I want to become a forensic nurse practitioner. I want to set new goals and visions. It's 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 just a whole every fighter that, especially a fighter who's done something in their lives career wise, you got to respect them whether they're boxing or they not, because it takes a special type of individual to go that far. And any and even if it's, it's somebody was only doing it for a year or two years. You can only gain. You can only gain learning learning the art of boxing. It ain't just two people fighting. There's so much more behind it. This is just a little sprinkle. I could keep talking. No, <laughs> I, I I get what you're saying because I grew up not just around boxing, but like my grandfather was a really high level amateur, and I don't really share this a lot, and I won't go boring into it. But I was instilled with the drive. You spoke to me when you said that because what I have. I won't get into my, but I have a lot of education that I've forced myself to go through. I've always had a job. I've always done, and it's like, at the same time, I always look at myself like I'm not accomplishing enough. Like I'm yeah, not doing it. And it, it comes down to you, when you're brought up in a certain 
competitive uh, family or a competitive yeah. sport, you just don't view the world as I'm going to do what's expected. You want to overperform. You want to. Exceed. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Look at look at most most all boxers who you know retired healthy who are champions or whatever the case may be. Yeah, George Foreman, Foreman Grill, Layla Ali, health activist. Even though I'm not much, I'm not a big fan of her. I still respect the woman for what she's done. You know, I'm not a fan of her as a, as a boxer. Still respect her for what what she's done. You understand? No, I I, I get that. So I want to get back to your amateurs. Even though you you uh, there was all this political upheaval, do you remember what your your amateur career was when it was all said and done? It was, yeah, it was 98 and 10. So and you, had, you won had, a lot of fights. You know what? I, you know what happened is for the amateurs, um, some of the, a lot of the amateurs, a lot of the amateurs, sometimes you would get what's called a walkover. So I had over, I had over a hundred fights, but I didn't, not every, I had a, over a hundred uh, championships. Not all of our championships, I'm sorry. On my record, in my license, I had over 100. However, you get you get walkovers in the in the amateurs, and if you get a walkover, they still mark it as a as a victory in your book. And, and even if you don't fight, because a walkover means either your opponent didn't show up, your opponent moved weight classes, or there was just nobody in your weight class. So if I really wanted to be realistic and say how many actual fights I've I've fought. I would say it was like in the 70, 80 range, 70s or 80s, because I had about 15 walkovers or something like that. This is 20 years ago. I don't, um, this 15 years ago when I turned pro, I don't really remember exactly the number because, you know, when you're 11, 12, 10 years old, you just get thrown in the silver lungs, thrown in the in junior Olympics. You get thrown in every tournament there is. So I don't really remember the exact number. I just knew what the, the final number was in my book. But yeah, I, either way, as a female in the amateurs, that's a lot of fights. Because as a woman in the as a woman in the amateurs, or as a young girl per se, you don't you don't. Back then, there was not a lot of girls that boxed. It, it just wasn't huge. It's probably a lot bigger today than it was then. But for me, it wasn't that big. But the reason why I had so much experience is because I, I was a little 116-pound skinny thing that went, I fought from 114 up to 132. I fought Jennifer Barber. She fought her whole pro career as a, one, a solid 5'7", 132-pounder. And I fought her as a little scrawny amateur. We moved weight classes is what I'm saying. So, so you, if we, you went to a tournament, you found, like, let's say there's no one at 118, you just jumped to a different weight class. Exa- to exactly. Fights. Exactly. There was no one at 118. Well, what's 114 got? Two girls. We're going. We're making 114. Well, what's 132 got? Three girls. What's 125 got? Three. I moved from 114 as high as 142. Back then, it was a 114. It used to be 118. I'm sorry, 119 pounder. And 112, but then they changed the weight classes like on to uh, 114, and then uh, I think it went to, from 114 to to 122, and then 122 to 135, and then one so forth. I, I don't really remember. It got changed while I was amateur, but but yeah, during that time I went as low as 114 or as high as 132 because we I knew I had the headgear, we knew we had the big old gloves on, and we knew. It was practice, and we didn't care win, lose, or draw. We didn't really care. All we cared about was the experience we got from it. Well, I you once again, I'm going back to like my default kind of answers, but you're, I'm glad we caught up because you're such a thoughtful person, and you say so like you're really smart, and I just like hearing you say things because you say things I want to hear boxers say, but a lot of times boxers either don't have the vocabulary to say it, or they're not willing to say it. I don't and have I that appreciate kind of vocabulary either, so thank well, you. I, I, I don't money. know. <laughs> but um, I guess one question I have is you're a, a badass women's boxer, pardon my language. You're doing it, but there's no real 
like path in the amateurs. So are you doing this kind of as something to do and you're bonding with your dad? What's the roadmap when you're in the amateurs? Like what's, what's your motivation to keep going? Are you just going tournament to tournament? Because as far as I remember, there's no Olympics for women's boxing until 2012. So the Olympics isn't even in the equation. What are you thinking about? So that, w- that wasn't always the case. So okay. initially, initially the Olympics were, were said to happen um, in the 20, what was it? Uh, not, not 2012, but 2008. Oh, and, okay. Yeah. And it, they said that women were going to be in the Olympics in 08 and that it was going to be a few weight classes. That's what, that's what talks were. Of course, nothing, nothing was final, just like 2012 was not final. Everything was, was in the talks. Well, um, as soon as I think it was 20, uh, 2005 um, or 2006, it, was, it, it had to be 20, 2006 because I know that as soon as we heard word that women were not going to be allowed in the 2008 Olympics, I went pro not even, not even six months later. I think it was as soon as we heard it, we were like, what's, what's the point of waiting till 2012? I've got so much experience. And, and not only that, but again, must I remind you, I was not the amateur favorite. Okay. I I wasn't, I could beat someone's, you know, behind and I wouldn't get the, I wouldn't get the victory. And you've got Mm -hmm. these big old gloves and headgear. The probability of you knocking people out is, is for me, for girls, in, the, in these shorter rounds, it was just not, it was harder. It was harder to do unless you had some Mike Tyson power. And I do believe you're either born with power or you just, you're not. You squeeze your power. I wasn't born with it, okay? I wasn't born with natural Mike Tyson power, but I did have heavy hands, you know, when I go to the body. So it was a gamble where we saw that we didn't have much to gain and so much to lose. And you know what? Even then, I couldn't make the Olympic weight class. What was it, 114? And then all the way up to uh, 132, it was 114 and then 132. <laughs> I couldn't make 114 if my life depended on it back then when I turned 18, 19 and became a young woman. And they, they weren't going to, what, it wasn't going to hit until when I was 20 years old. That couldn't happen. 114 at 20 years old for me, we just, it, I have a different, my body structure couldn't squeeze that small. You know what I'm saying? So it, there was no real benefit for us to to wait. It just there was nothing for us, so we went pro. And I just wanted to elaborate on something because I've I've witnessed this, and I believe this is what you're saying. But sometimes listeners haven't lived the sport of boxing, so I just want to take them on a journey of to for me to clarify if this is what you're saying. In amateur boxing, amateur boxing like professional boxing, but sadly I found more so is very political where you definitely need to know people and you need to facilitate great relationships in order to um, to have things work in your favor. And I'm not even saying like judging or anything like that to be sent to a training camp or to be sent mm-hmm. to international tournaments or to get jackets. And it mm-hmm. seems like you were not in favor with the establishment based off of your dad being outspoken and just being who he was. Absolutely. But, you know, the reason why it, it's so political and, it, and it's, it's an underlying issue that a lot of politics judges and officials don't even realize it's happening. But the reason why is because the way amateur boxing is, is uh, scored, you've got two people with these headgears and small gloves going at a, a, speed, t- a speed test, <laughs> punches and bunches where – at the end of the round, you're like, uh, who won that round? That's how it was for the most part. They started implementing the points, the point system, but it wasn't like that when I was growing up. So when you have fights like that, you at the end of the day, at the end of the fight, you've you've got basically who do you like? They both did really good. Who do you like more? That's what it was. A and I feel like that's pro boxing to this day. Like I always tell people, like at club shows. And I hate that this is how I feel, but when I go to pro boxing, I go to a lot of local shows to support young fighters. A lot of times the judges, they've sat through five or six bad fights. Let's be honest. They're not the mm-hmm. best fights. And they're mm-hmm. thinking about where they're going to go eat. 
They're gonna are we going to Olive Garden? <laughs> are we going to yeah. and then they go, Oh shit, it's twenty seconds left in the round. And yeah. they might judge a round off five seconds or if they're familiar with someone. And I know it sucks and people say that's their job, but you try sitting through six really bad fights and it's <laughs> ten o'clock and you're sixty five years old and you go to bed at eleven. It this mm-hmm. is just I don't really believe in corruption as much as most people. I just believe people get tired and people make mistakes. And yeah. yeah, I'm just talking. No, I know. I I just can't. I can't necessarily speak on behalf of the pro judges because I'm not. You know, I'm not very. I don't. I haven't really looked into it as much. And what I don't really know. You know how they do it. I, I thought they switched off during sort of the first four fights, and then the next four are another set of judges. And then I, to me, when you love boxing, you don't really get tired watching fights. I mean, I'm just real. Like, I well, you, two hours of sleep, and I keep watching it, and I'm so interested into it. But feel like by all we means, couldn't, but by like, all means, like, who wants yeah. to be a judge? Like, who wants, it's like being a hall yeah. monitor. It's like a weird, it's a weird thing to want to be. Uh, yeah, right. But you know what? I was a judge for a couple of MMA fights. Um, I was I was asked to judge because of my professional license as a fighter. Um, at one of these small one of these small shows, and I really enjoyed it. I did. I really liked it. Um, I was fair. I think it. I think it boils down to the morality of it, uh, and and what type of people are being selected to be judges. Because you know, just like you have people who are who who have a, a pre- prejudice, you know, views on things. It's the same in boxing. You just you're not always going to have a perfect panel of judges. It's like that in any in any job. You're just not going to have everyone on the same page morally. So I mean, I, there are because I, I have heard you know in the background as a pro, you know, comments from officials like barely hit him, hit him, I'm gonna give him a knockdown. You know, I like it. You know, it, it's like it's human. It, no human is perfect. It's going to be anywhere. You can have it anywhere. But hopefully, I mean, I think that it's not nowhere near as bad as the amateurs are as the pros. The reason why I say that is because the pros are, are in the spotlight. They're in the spotlight all the time. These big mega fights are on, are on TV, and, and you've got sponsors behind it, promoters behind it, money behind it. So it's a little bit different of a of a platform, whereas the amateurs – there, there's no compensation involved. There's no sponsors, and it's just it's really a favorite thing. So it happens more, and it happens often than it should in the Amazon. Yeah, I mean it's boxing's just very stressful because it's like it's kind of like the greatest sport because it's like it it has every aspect of life and entertainment and sport. It's like everything that makes us human. So like we're naturally yeah. drawn to it. But then it's often like the business of boxing makes all of us hate it. It's like it takes away all of our initial joy that brought us mm-hmm. to this great sport. Is like I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I can understand. I can understand. I've heard people say similar things who are not raised in the boxing industry, but they were fans of it. You know, on the outside looking in, and they would say things like, "Man, that last fight, I don't even want to watch boxing anymore." You know. That last decision, I don't even want to watch it anymore. So I completely understand. I, I For me, it's understand. like the the more I'm around it, it's like mm-hmm. I understand, like, the matchmaking now. So it's like let's say Teofimo doesn't fight Lomachenko coming up. Well, mm-hmm. why, why shouldn't he just fight, like, a guy like Mike Reed? He's a southpaw, similar height. Now, the fans won't like that fight. It's not, like, the best fight probably on paper. But it's a perfect tune-up fight for him. And it's more that's just like how can we get these fighters to fight similar people for that big money fight? And that's yeah. like often what boxing is where the fans don't get it. Is, or how can we get this guy who's diminished to get on someone's resume to bulk up his Hall of Fame credentials? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. I agree with that. It's all about – it's all about – there are people who are all about fictionism and – and basically what you're saying is, you know, the favoritism aspect of it. So I understand where you're coming from. But let's get back to you. You're more interested in these, these other people. So you turn pro in <laughs> San Bernardino against Susanna Warner. It's your first fight. 
as a professional, what do you remember about this fight week, about turning pro, about getting medicals done, the going to the ring? What do you remember about any of that? It was a blur. I don't remember anything about medicals. I don't remember anything about turning pro. I don't remember any of that. I'll be honest, the only thing I remember is leading up to the fight, the fight, and the aftermath of the fight. <laughs> so, so <laughs> I barely remember the leading up to the fight, to the fight part. So what I do remember, I do remember that my fourth grade teacher was in the audience, and she wrote a letter that, that said, I'm here reading for you. And I, someone took it to my dressing room. I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. Um, and then I also remember that Patrick Ortiz did a hell of a job promoting the fight, had me on the bulletin, had me on the radio, and he just did a great job. He's an amazing promotional promoter. It's unfortunate he didn't he didn't like to work <laughs> with us because <laughs> for other reasons, um, <laughs> communication reasons. Uh, anyways, but. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're the West family. We're rowdy. But anyway, um, he was a smaller promoter. I mean, he, he did a hell of a job promoting me in my local area. And, um, and in, that, in that aspect of what, he's, what he did, you know, he brought what, I, what we do, I was capable of doing during that time, and that was selling out a venue. So I remember selling out the venue to where the, the officials were like, we need more chairs. We need more we need more seating. We ran out. We, we don't know how they still have tickets. We, and, and it was more like, a, oh, my God, this is a completely packed venue. This is insane. The officials of the casino walked up to us and said, we want you back. We want you back for sure. We don't want anyone to come unless you are back. <laughs> they loved me. The, the uh, head, uh, Sancho's, <laughs> head Sancho's of the casino did. So that's a good thing when you can get a casino behind you, regardless of the promoter. When you get the casino behind you, you're, you're going to be using good hands. So, anyway, that that's what I really remember about everything was the promotion, the aspect. But when it came to the fight, even the fight, even the fight was a blur. I just remember being so dang excited that <laughs> the, my nerves were run, running so fast that I just ran, ran out there. And you know what I mean? And was like, let's go. That was it. I just was in their face, like in Susanna's face, like I don't, you're never gonna, you're not gonna win, you're not gonna win, you're not gonna win, you ain't gonna win. That was my, that was my mind. It was like you can't win, you're not gonna win. I've been waiting my whole life for this. Nobody's gonna beat me. Like that. I just would turn from this little humble amateur to this is it. This is my only. Um, this is my last option. I don't want to ever lose. I want to win the people. I want to win the fans. I want to be famous. I want to be everybody you know my name. That was that was how my 18 year old brain was processing. It didn't process anything else but that way. And you were 18 years old fighting in a casino. Was there any discrepancies with age? I guess you can be 18 years old and go to a casino, right? Um. So. <laughs> I had two big old security guards walking, <laughs> walking me. Okay, you're bringing me back. So I had two big old security guards walking me in and out of the, in and out of the ring. Um, pretty much, pretty much. Uh, telling me the casino is telling me I can't do anything, but go from the dressing room to the ring arena, and that's it. And I had to have security walking me back and forth to do that because of the restrictions of the of the age limit. And I don't I honestly don't think that the casino knew my age until I actually had to fight. Because I remember throughout it all they were like, What what do you mean? Wait, what she's twenty well, she's twenty one, isn't she? <laughs> So like while you're fighting, you're hearing that, or while you're announced. While I was there, you know, after my fight, when when people in the casino were trying to pull me for photos and such, and I was in the casino area afterwards, it it was a oh oh she's what oh oh shoot oh no, uh, let's get security officers to escort her here and there and, and make sure she doesn't go there and only bring her to there and it was so funny. Because it was like, I, I when I was that young, I'll be honest with you, 
I don't even think I thought about it either. I really don't. I think I was just like, oh, cool. This is where I'm going to fight. Let's go. <laughs> so good times. That's funny. So then you, you fight March 25th. You fight Tanya Cravens. And do oh, you remember absolutely. anything about that one? Yeah, I remember I thought she was on crack. You could let her know. She, her eyes were staring at me like like she had Adderall in her system. I was like, oh, you know what? I wouldn't be surprised. So, uh, so she was she, Damn, she was a, a hell of a statement. She was a rude awakening. She was a rude awakening because, you know, she didn't have much about her on on paper and she wasn't very very well known in the amateur. And that girl was tough as hell. And she when she what was funny about fighting her was I felt I'll never forget I felt I felt like my hands were gonna break. She just kept coming and coming and coming. And I would hit her dead in her forehead. Boom, 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 over and over, over. And my hands felt like, I don't think my hands could tolerate this any longer. Because <laughs> my hands is hitting hard skull. <laughs> it, 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 don't, it don't feel right. But she kept coming. And, and I'll be honest, that was, that was an eye-opener for me as a pro. It don't matter the record. It doesn't matter the person. You going in there with somebody who's re- there and ready and that's going to fight you, fight you, and you, you respect all pros. You know, all pros were about something for a reason. All pros had a pro license for a reason. A pro is a pro for a reason. I don't care if they're a pro with a record of five and five. They're a pro for with a record of five and five for a reason. So she taught me that real early on because before that I was an amateur and all I thought is, well, the best of the best have so many amateur fights and so many amateur titles, and girls with no amateur or, or little amateur are going to be a breeze. They're going to be easier. And heck no. Uh-uh. I learned real quickly that it's not, no, that's not how it is. So that was pretty, I like I like that. Okay, and then we go to, you had a fight in Montebello at the Quiet, uh, the Quiet Canyon against Elizabeth Cervantes. Uh, do you remember anything about this one? So the quiet can okay, so she was, I think she was the one, I, I won by unanimous decision, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Tony Kravitz. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, no, 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 wait. Tony Kravitz. No, no, no. Um, uh, Tony Kravitz. I want to say she was um that's that too I thought that was the one that I what was the name of the last one that you just said? No, the last one was Tony Cravens. This is yeah, Elizabeth yeah. Okay. Cervantes. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I got thrown off. Okay. Um no, so so Elizabeth Cervantes, she was a re I she's the one that I fought twice, right? I fought her twice. Yeah, you fought her twice. So is that just because like you couldn't get opponents? So you ended exactly. up fighting her two oh, times. Yeah, she is, yeah, she's her family, her her husband. We'll do it again. We'll do it again. So she was last minute. <laughs> we'll do it. Let's go. We're ready. We're all we stay ready. We'll be so, uh, we'll do it on five days notice. Something oh like yeah, that. yeah. Ex- yep, that's exactly what it was. So uh so anyway, when I saw her I honestly do remember being disappointed in myself because I wanted to I wanted to knock her out because of uh I was able to watch her on- online. I think we set, we found some footage online, and if you judge her by how she fights, you she's an awkward fighter. But I learned once again, I learned real early that those awkward fighters are so difficult. They're difficult to to land solid shots, and so that fight, I mean, I won unanimously, but I wanted to win spectacular. I wanted it to be a spectacular victory. It was early in my career. I was upset because I, I thought I would have knockouts, and it wasn't happening. So I was I was disappointed in it, in my performance. But yeah, and no then one. you you come to my area and you actually fight on a friend of mine's card. I actually went to kind of a, a celebration of his life a few years ago before he passed, and that was sad. Oh. But you fought on Jerry mm-hmm. Hoffman's card. Oh uh, yeah, I believe. That's a, yeah. And yep. um, that was Jerry was a good guy, but you fought at the Monterey cards, and you fought kind of like a tune-up opponent in Maria Contreras. 
But then you fight an undefeated girl, uh, Stella. I can't pronounce her last name, but you come up to oh, the wow. Bay Area. Yep. Do you remember anything about these fights? They happened within oh. four months of each other. Oh yeah, of course I do. So uh, Jerry, Jerry was so his hospitality was amazing, and he loved us and we loved him. He was, and he's just an amazing guy. I'm talking about from the very beginning of booking in our room to the very end of checking out. This guy is just so nice. And um, I remember when we went there the first time, it was one of those, oh, we got to go again. And there's a lot of Filipinos in the in the Bay Area up there. That's what I, I remember. And Daily City I, shout out, you know, <laughs> Daily City stand up. There we go. And and he and he said that they loved me and that they he wants to bring me back because he wants to promote me over there and he really wants me to, you know, continue to fight over there because I, I did a good job selling tickets. And it's true because I had a lot of people hit me up after my fight wanting to follow my career, inviting me to their restaurant, so forth and so on. Um, and anyway, so I fought Maria and I remember Maria. She was a, she, the way I felt about Maria was the same way that I felt about the Elizabeth Cervantes performance. You know, she was a great, tough fighter. I I started, I I was young, though. You know, I was very young. I hadn't developed the the same strength that I developed later on in my career. But I wanted it. I wanted to have it, and I didn't. But I was was just happy that I was still winning. You know, going from an amateur career where you're not the favorite and you lose in the finals because of the other person's the favorite, you, you end up being grateful for every victory that you get. And so when they brought me back, it's funny the Stella Neoff because Stella Neoff was w- one of the. And I apologize for not saying it right. It was Neoff. I forgot. But she was one of the amateur standouts who was getting these victories because of who she was and her name. She had I don't remember exactly the number about, but I, it was about 15 national championships in the amateur. She was the favorite when I was coming up. She was the one that I couldn't even get to sometimes because I would get eliminated by the by the state, the California state favorite, or, or I'm sorry, the regional champion, you know, who was Texas, Texas, uh, Texas favorite Vanessa Horton, or whatever the case was. I just never got to, I never got to, you know, meet with her in the ring as an amateur. So this fight was really interesting. We were very, 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 very interested because – we knew it was a big test fight. She was a Southie. She was Southpaw. And she was just a huge, huge standout. And I, if anything, she underestimated me, and I feel bad for her. I know she did. She, Damn. Yeah, Damn. she underestimated me. I do. I, I know that. I know that for a fact. Um, because I wasn't a fight she should have took that early in her career. I think she was, what, 2-0? and She's one zero and one, and you kind of retired her. She never fought again after you. Yeah. Yep. I know. So, and, and you know what? It's probably because she underestimated me. I was not. I was not the one that you know how you hear these names when it comes to men and the amateurs and your yeah, and like your Shakur life. Stevenson, like yes, Keyshawn Davis right exactly. now, like exactly. Earl Spence before. Exactly. She was one there of the tent go. pole people. She was like probably exactly. like Michaela Mayer, where you're like Ex- she's yes. an Olympian. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. That's what she was, not me. I was that random fighter from California that was tough. That's all I was. But I was something like, that she was supposed to demolish. You were the good <laughs> fighter. Like you're at national tournaments. She's yeah. tough, but she yeah. like people would be like she she has talent, but she doesn't quite put it together. They'd use coded language to say this other person's a little right. above you or something. Exactly, exactly. So that that's it. That's exactly that was exactly what I was trying to say. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, so, I got you. We're on the same page. I got you. Yeah, back. yeah. So so I mean, think about it. If you faced somebody that your entire amateur career, you thought your the whole time you thought, oh, they're a breeze, they're they're not any good. I'm gonna take them out real easy, and then they beat you. And not only do they beat you, but they they put a new hole in your butt. You're gonna <laughs> you might second guess what you're doing. You might second guess your career because that should have been an easy fight for you. You know what I mean? So that's that's what I believe happened. That's what I believe happened there. I don't know. I've never had a conversation with her about it. I just did what I was told to do. She was a tough girl. 
I could say that, that there was, it might have been a good call for her because she was a lot older than me. And she did have a very long, um, very successful amateur career. And and there was, after her, I, I saw a lot of fighters who were a lot better. Um, like, I don't want to say better, but a lot stronger. More lot difficult. Stiffer. I'll just, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll throw it out for you. Like, they presented more challenges. Exactly, exactly, than the, the, that fight was. And, you know, and I tell I tell a lot of fans, fans of the sport, but don't necessarily understand the science behind it. I do tell them, I tell them, I tell them that, uh, you know, when it comes to boxing, you could be the best amateur, but that doesn't mean a damn thing when you go pro. <laughs> it doesn't, because... You know, uh, what's that rule? Tyson, I think he said everybody has a plan until they get hit. Who says that? Uh, That's Tyson. That's real shit. Yeah. yeah. So when, there's the meaning behind that, that phrase of everybody has a plan until they get hit. It's not hit by any punch. It's hit with an eight-ounce glove with no headgear on as a professional. That's what he means by it. So to me, I'm over here like, you're an amateur, buddy. You ain't never been hit. You know, take off that headgear and get hit. And and it's like, hey, things change. Some sometimes the ballpark of amateurs. That's all you. You're great, but you don't have the toughness mentally and physically to do, to do the same thing you did as an amateur in the pro. <laughs> There's a lot of fights like that. I think they aren't they taking away the headgear though. They took away the headgear, right? They took away the well. It, it's I get so confused with USA Boxing because I know a lot of people who are involved and I respect USA Boxing, but it seems very inconsistent. Like they go on four year periods where they change things up. I believe headgear is gone, but now with this coronavirus, who even knows what's happening? I know, I know. It, it, boxing took a. I, you know what though? They took a time to reflect on what they're doing in the in the pros and how they're doing things. Because I hear complaints all the time. UFC makes not even a quarter amount of what a professional boxing champion makes, and I'm like, <laughs> I'm like that's because the promoters and the TV networks run it. They run it. They run boxing. You know, they it, a lot of great fights are not being made. Because they run it, and yeah. it'll continue that way until either a there's a new process of who who fights who, and it being mandatory, such as the UFC. That's what they do. They make fights mandatory. Dana White doesn't play. He doesn't play. He makes the fights that the fans want to see happen. And yeah, when it comes to the pay scale. They can do better. I don't know much information on the aspect of how UFC is paid, how they're, they've got their pay system set up. But when it comes to boxing, what I do know is there should be mandatory bouts that are made, mandatory fights. But there's not. So hopefully no. during this pandemic, I don't think so, though. I doubt it. That's wishful thinking from a boxing fan's perspective. <laughs> no, they're just gonna they're gonna look to turn a profit. Sadly, right. like that's gonna be the the thing. But to keep going, who was Carly Beatty, who you had a split decision with, and what happened in that fight? And furthermore, where is the Valley Center? You know what? I think that was at Fantasy Springs. That was at Fantasy Springs, which okay. was a, I think that was. That was a casino, no? Yeah, the Harris Rincon, Rincon Casino. Yep. When I skateboarded, there was a place called Rincon that people would try to go to, but I've never been anywhere near that, or I don't know of where that is. It was a beautiful venue. It was very pretty. Um, the one that where I fought with, and uh, it, I mean, Carly Betty was very, very good. She was very tough. After that fight, immediately I threw up. I threw up all over the place. I was extremely dehydrated when I saw her. I was I wasn't as strong as I wanted to be. And you know what? I didn't fight I didn't fight my fight because of it. So 
you know, I'm a, I'm a boxer. I'm a quick boxer. I'm on my feet. I move about. I'm in and out. And, and a lot of people don't they don't they don't like that. Who that's just because it's what it's my it's my masterpiece as a fighter. But for that fight, I was way too weak and too dehydrated to do that. So I fought. I didn't fight my fight. I fought her. her I fought her fight. I fought her toe to toe in the pocket. It's changing blows left and right to the body. If you look up the photos for that fight, you'll see me in in a bubble with her. That was that fight. <laughs> so I, I think if I would have fought my fight, I would have definitely won unanimously. Um, the girl's head was hard as hard as nails, hard as rocks. I, I don't know if I would have been able to just knock her out or anything like that because she was tough. She was, she had a hard head and she just kept going. She, I mean, she was a former Marine. I think she became a firefighter too. She was a tough girl, tough, tough girl. And, and the thing is, is I, I fought her fight. I still won, but I fought, I fought her fight. And those who saw me victorious, I remember coming up to me and saying, yes, you won that fight without a doubt. You know, the ones who did see me win, they did say, it was a close fight because of the way you fought, but you, you won the, the cleaner and more finesse punches. That was that was it. She was punching a lot of my shoulders, my arms, my gloves, you know, missing, sliding off the head. Whereas with my punches, you land and it was, oh, 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 you know, right, right in there. But she just was a, she was a beast that didn't stop coming. Yeah, so you were landing like the actual the telling po- the telling punches the the meaningful shots, whereas she was throwing kind of more volume and just being physically durable. A- Amateur, she would have won, but because it's the pros and they they count power punches, I won. That's that's basically how to how to explain that's how that. That's great. How that's that, a how great way. Yeah. So then after that fight, you get your first career stoppage in Mexico. How did that feel after going so long, no knockout, and then you get a TKO win? Terrible. It felt terrible. You know why? Because that girl should not have been in the ring with me. She should. And you know what? I didn't even get paid for that fight. And, and I kind of wouldn't have felt good taking any money for that fight. Thanks for the victory. Thanks for the knockout. I didn't feel, I, and I was good enough because that, that fight should not have happened. But it's Mexico. They do whatever the hell they want to do out there sometimes well back in the days i don't know how it is now i haven't been out there but when i was there when i fought that fight that girl should not have been in the ring me and and you know what it was disrespectful it it was disrespectful from her to think she could even have a chance with me that's how i take every fight well you signed up for this so i don't feel pitiful for you it it takes away the victory of mine because then when i knock this person out who shouldn't have been in the ring with me it makes me feel like well i just did what i was supposed to do but if you would have had at least a little bit to offer and I knocked you out, I would feel a lot better about myself. I mean, it, it, that fight is actually available on YouTube, by the way. I think it's called k Wild Wild West, or it's just called uh, In Mexico. I think it's just k No, nah, I think it's called Kalisha West in Mexico. But it's I'm going to watch that fight, and I, I'm expecting someone that's completely not in shape that's just it's getting that. beat up. It's that. No, you know, she's in shape. She's in shape, but she looked like... She was 12 years old. She just looked young, and I actually think she was 16, and and she uh, she bounced around the ring. And I knew in the first 30 seconds I was going to knock her out. I mean, and actually less than that, first 10 seconds, I was like, oh, my goodness. Oh, my. Oh, my goodness. These are the type of fighters that I have to go light on because they just started last week. And I, I guess she has some experience. I don't know, but I, I, I felt Taylor Riles was upset about that. Whatever. So then you come back. You come back. You fight Elizabeth Moreno, and then you fight Elizabeth Cervantes again. But you stop her in the first round. Was that kind of um? A, was that like your first knockout? You felt good about because you kind of fought someone you had fought prior. You wanted to stop her, and then you actually do stop her. I'll tell you everything. You know what? That was a beautiful, beautiful night for me. But you know who killed it? The promoters killed it. You know why? Because that was on the James Tony undercard. Now it's supposed to be my television de- debut, and I was told that it would be my television my television de- debut. And so, with knowing that that was going to be my TV debut, I was ready to be the best 
of the West King Wild that anybody's ever seen. Again, this is, mind you, this is back when my, my mind was, I'm going to be the greatest female. Everybody's going to know my name. I was so driven back then. So when I knew this was, gonna, this was my opportunity to be on TV with James Tony Undercard, I was considered a swing bout, and if there's knockouts, bam, boom, boom. It was, it was laid out for me, right? I was so excited. First off, they made me the very last bout of the evening. Walk the, very, the very last bout of the evening. Very last bout of the evening. Here I am, an undefeated up-and-coming prospect, and I'm going after these guys who have records that are like 10 and 5. But I'm a female. Well, I'm the very last bout. Whatever, right? But then I thought, okay, well, let's what we can knock out. Guess what happened that night? Look up that card. Every single person knocked out who they were in the ring with, even me. Every fight was a knockout. So do you want to know how my mindset was going in there? Oh, I'm going to be on TV. Oh, my God. I'm going to be on TV. You understand what I'm saying? No, I get what you're saying. It says that Jeff Lacey was the main event, and Daniel Jacobs was on the card, and Seth Mitchell. And everyone but Jeff Lacey got a knockout. Okay, okay, wait, wait, wait. Wait, 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 wait. No, no, no. Maybe I'm – okay, so if, if it wasn't James Tony, I must have been thinking that that was the opportunity that I was going to get from this fight. Because I thought it was James Tony, but if you're saying it was Jeff Lacey – then maybe that's how it was because because I do remember that I was going to have the opportunity to be on like a James Tony undercard or something like that. I just remember James Tony's name being thrown out there. But uh, in any case, I just remember that no no okay hold on I gotta go back. Are you hold on I gotta go back. Let me go back to my. Are you looking at um? I'm I'm box rec gangstering right now. I got my ski yeah. mask on and everything. I'm on the box rec. Yeah, because correct me if I'm wrong. I thought it was James Tony, or they might be wrong. They it's they have it as Jeff Lacey getting a majority decision, and then everyone else on the undercard got like first or second round knockouts. It ain't that something? Because I didn't know I fought on the card with Danny Jacobs either. I did not know that. If that's what you're saying, you're referring to um, 2008 uh, six twenty seven, right? Oh no, I'm on seven twenty three. Oh, okay, hold on. The first round knockout. Let me go up. Let me go up. Let yeah, go you're up. you're like super famous. Like you've been <laughs> on all these cards with famous people and stuff and they say ma'am and all that stuff. But yeah, it says Jeff Lacey versus Mendoza and it looks like Jeff had a really hard fight with Mendoza. And then everyone else got a stoppage and most of them were in the first round. Okay, then maybe that is, maybe that was, okay, I'm going there. I'm going there right now. Okay, so it was Jeff Lacey. Wow, I did not know I fought on that car with um <laughs> with Seth Mitchell and uh, after me and uh, Danny Jacobs. Okay, then, let me see. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense, yeah. Because all I know is who, who, did got, who got the um, decision? Uh, Jeff Lacey. Oh, okay. So Jeff Lacey got the decision. Oh, okay. Got it. Well, yeah, then that means they just chose, they ended up choosing a different fighter to be the knockout on TV is what they did. Because they said that if, if there was knockouts on the card, then they would be able to, you know, televise my fight. That's what I was told as I was a swing, a swing bout. But whatever the case from there i was supposed to fight with james tony on his undercard depending on how i perform there and that didn't end up happening but anyway let me go back so yeah i was that was a her if you watch the video that's also on youtube it's funny because you know what caused that was the crowd the audience did it she hit me she hit me with a punch a overhand while a overhand all right, <laughs> and the crowd went ooh, and I got so mad. I got so mad that the crowd did that that I was like, oh, okay, okay, my turn, my turn. 
But my turn ended up being a knockout. <laughs> the punch that I landed ended up being a devastating punch. And I'll never forget the combination. It was a left hook to the body, left hook to the head, and then a straight right. And I fought, I just finished with a, another left hook, but I ended up knocking out with a straight right. You know? So. That's crazy that that's such a memorable moment in your life that you remember the exact combination and everything. It will always be because when she went when she went down and I had already fought her before and I knew I knew she had a, a hard head. I didn't expect that at all. I didn't expect that at all. So I remember it being such a shock to me. It's one of those moments that you just remember. You understand? You just remember yeah. that. And I remember. Just, you just remember it. Then we get to like probably one of the more memorable fights of your career. Uh, you fight Ava Knight for the first time in Freont, which I have no clue where that is, at the Table Mountain Casino. That sounds like totally like boxing and just a weird place. <laughs> How did this fight go- come together? And what are you, I'm feeling like you're probably already kind of like a little frustrated with boxing right now. Like you haven't been getting the knockouts. People are kind of not telling you the truth, saying that you could be on TV. And now you're in a fight with Ava Knight. Just how did this come together? So you're absolutely right about the disappointment. But at that time, I was still undefeated. So I still felt, you know, a lot of hope. And um, and when I went in the fight with her, first of all, I had no idea who she who she was. You know, she I think she only had about 20-something, 30 amateur fights. So when I went in there with her, we didn't have any footage on her. We had no perspective, no opinion, no coaches, anything. But this is what really pissed me off. Uh, Karina Moreno was in Southern California getting ready for a championship cup fight. We gave her weeks of hard, good sparring. And she even recorded me. She was recording me. Now, whether or not... They gave that footage to, to Team Knight. It's still kind of I feel mixed. like when you say whether or not, I feel like you feel a certain way. I feel like you're saying this in a in the nicest way possible, but I'm letting people know. I feel like you're saying this in a politically right way, but I'm I'm interpreting this my own way. Well, the, the reason why is because I'm I'm a person of logic and I'm a person of, of facts. I'm a per, I'm a person of evidence. I need to know. I need to see the, the true evidence. I don't really like to go by hearsay, hearsay she said. So what I'm saying to you is based on the fact that she came out a southpaw in the first round. She came out knowing about my game. She came out knowing how to fight me. She somehow mysteriously, conspiracy, knew a lot about me as if she saw me. And and mind you, at this time, there was no footage of me available online. There was no footage of me back then. So back to what I was saying is, when Corinna Moreno was in Southern California, and all of a sudden Corinna Moreno is from Northern California, and all of a sudden Corinna Moreno helped Ava Knight get ready for the fight, and all of a sudden... Uh, uh, Corinna Moreno's coach was the only one that I sat down and said, oh, I can't stand fighting lefties, big mistake by me, being a dodo little young girl trying to just be a champion, talking to coaches like they're my best friends, me telling uh, Coach Corinna Moreno's coach, telling her, oh, yeah, I don't like fighting lefties. And then Ava Knight comes out in the first round as a lefty. It's like something was up with that. So that's my point. She had footage on me. She knew how I fought. She fought her fight. I fought my fight in the beginning, and everyone says I was dominating. And then I'll never forget what happened in the fourth. Somebody ran up to our corner and said, you're losing the fight, man. You got to get in her face, man. You losing. You losing. And I said, oh, damn, hell no. You got to get in there and fight her. That's what I said as a young person. And my dad, you know, he too said, you got you to get in there and get your point. You got to get in there and fight, Kleisha. So <laughs> I went I went in there and I didn't fight my fight anymore. But you know why I was boxing? Because that girl hit so damn hard. In that first round when she ran out there lefty and she hit me with that straight left in the face right on the chin, I felt my body vibrate. I just have a strong chin. I didn't go down. Somebody without a chin would have went down right in that moment, first 30 seconds of the fight. I got hit with something that I wasn't ready for. So the rest of the fight, I don't want to call myself scared. But to damn right, I was backpedaling and not letting myself get hit by that again. I was being a smart fighter, and I was winning. 
and the judges even had me up on the scorecards going into the last three rounds. They had it. They had it. Uh, me three, her three, and then the last, the last two, I fought her fight. And so they gave her, they gave her. Um, it was like four to, or, or three to four, something like that, or I don't remember, but I do remember that the end of the fight, I did not fight my fight. I didn't fight my fight. And I, I got hit a lot. She got hit a lot. We both got hit a lot. We went toe-to-toe. But she is just a, a very strong girl. So when she was hitting me, it was like, whoa. And when I was hitting her, it was just like clean. <laughs> and it took me a while to face that loss because I'll be honest with you, for a long time, I didn't think that I lost. Um, I thought that I really felt in my heart that I was robbed. But that's how champions are when they've never been defeated. I was on an undefeated rampage of victory. So if you were going to beat me, I needed to be I needed to be beat badly. And I wasn't beat badly. You know, it's like they say when you fight the champion, you got to really beat them up to win the championship title. I was not beat beaten up. He never beat me up. So with my champion mindset, I was like, man, no, nah, there's no way I lost. But I did some reflecting, and I thought about things that I could have done different, and I thought about things that I should have done different. And ultimately, I said, all right, she had that one. She'll have that one. You know what I'm saying? <sighs> but whatever. Well, well, I'm not trying to – we're not trying to go through the past darkly, but I, I get what you're saying. It looks like on your record you took a bounce-back fight to get your record back. You beat someone, and then you kind of hit this weird point in your career – you fight eight of eight of Velez, you get a majority decision, and then you go overseas and get a majority decision, which I've never seen the fight against Anita Christian, but I'm going to assume you won and that that was just kind of politics. What kind of is happening when you have these back-to-back draws? So, you know what? After Ava, it was it was hard to get any – any, you know, opponent to gain my confidence back. And I'm speaking from a coach's perspective. You know, a coach doesn't want to throw their fighter in there with somebody who they're going to get their confidence taken away, especially after coming off a loss. That's just what management should do for their fighters if they care about their fighters in and out the ring from a behavioral aspect, behavioral health aspect. So when I went in there, I mean, when I fought, you know, Ada Velez, with Ada Velez, we did not plan to fight Ada Velez because Ada Velez was a one hell of a, a fighter. She was a freaking three division world title holder. I used to take photos with her when I was 16, when she was a world champion. And we didn't want to fight her. She was never our intention. But what happened was is Patrick Ortiz from San Manuel Casino kept saying he was going to get this other fighter who wasn't as good as her, and it never ended up happening. And then about two, three weeks before the fight, uh, I got uh, Ada Velez. We said, what? And, and we couldn't believe that he wanted, he wanted me to fight Ada Velez as my, um, as my return fight. We just couldn't believe it. And we were like, first off, she's a lefty. Kalisha's as far as nothing but right-handers. Second off, she a former three division world champion, you know, and is an amazing boxer. Amazing. I don't care if she's been in the pen because she just got out the pen. I don't care if she's been in the pen. That just means she's been training even hard. <laughs> that means she's hella shape, right? So, so me and my dad was my dad mainly was like, no. I was like, I don't care anybody. That was how I was. I don't care anybody. My dad was like, hmm. Later on, maybe let me just get somebody else not as rough. But eventually I told my dad something that I knew what he would steal the deal. I said, Dad, you know what? Demand more money, a 1000 around. Tell him a 1000 around. That type of pay, by the way, for a female back in the day for a six-round or non-type of fight is unheard of. You don't, you don't hear that, 1000 around. So I said, just tell him 1000 around. We'll do it. Boom. And this was back when Sam Manuel loved me. You know, remember what I told you about the casino yeah. loving me? This is when they loved me because of my pro debut. So they told that they told Patrick Ortiz, "We we really want Kalisha on this fight. Get, get we'll do what you do what you got to do to get her on the fight." And so 
<laughs> so he saved me a thousand dollars per round, but he wasn't happy about it. He was pissed off, actually, really pissed off. And uh, we, I fought that fight. I to this day, I know it wasn't a draw. At the very end, when Ada gave me a hug, I'll never forget the words she said. She said, "Hey, that was good, baby girl. That was good. Uh, we gotta do this again. You know, you got this one." That's what she told me. She said, "This is that was good. We gotta do this again, but you got this one." She was very disappointed. I was catching her left and right the whole fight, but you know, some judges they don't score fights based on a, a Sugar Ray Leonard style. But I had to do that with her. She was really good and really good on the inside. I don't know if you've seen her fight with Melinda Cooper, but that was how she won on the inside. And I knew what I had to do with her. I had to box her. I respected her. I respected her for why and how she was a champion. So I, I fought her on the outside, and I beat her. I, I landed a lot of a lot of shots. A lot of people said, you clearly won, Kalisha. And uh, even she said it, you know. And, and the fact that it was a draw, I mean, I'm not upset about it because she was, you know, she was a great, she was a great champion. I could see if it was a draw against somebody I was supposed to demolish. So, you know, I can't really be upset about it. Um, but in the same, you know, way, I still feel like I won the fight. And then when you go to Denmark, what was that like? So that fight, I I had trained, I had trained, uh, I trained really hard for that fight, really hard. I was in the best shape. I was in one of the best shapes of my life. And um, to me, it was like, this is my opportunity, world title. Got to get it. Got to get it. But she was, uh, Anita Christian was really tall, five six, And we actually have that fight on DVD. It's just not uploaded. We, we should put it out there. I won that fight. Ten, uh, 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 nine out of ten rounds. That's, nine, that's nine, like one of those hometown decisions where it's like you went into someone's backyard and you got a sketchy scorecard thing. You know what? I'm grateful that they even gave me a draw. Before going there, everybody said, you're going to lose. Media. I won't say any reporter names, but reporters, this is dumb. Why are you going? You're not the favorite. You're going to lose. You got to knock him off to win. Anita's tall. She's tough. She's fought a lot of girls. You're going to lose even if you beat her. That's what I was told. So when I came back, I was like, I didn't lose. <laughs> and, you know, a draw overseas means you won the damn fight. So I, I wasn't, I, I, if anything, we celebrated more because of what we were told upon going there. It's like, you, it's like going to a foreign, foreign area where everybody's against you, nobody's with you, and you still come out with them shaking your hand, you know, with them showing you respect. And it was one hell of an experience. And the promoters were these, it, the hospitality of the Vesters, Alan and Alan Vester and their family, it, it, it made the experience so worthwhile, even though it was a draw. Going to Europe, the way they treated us, everything, rolled out the red carpet, I had to meet people from Scotland and meet people from, uh, you know, Amsterdam and all all over, you know, and it was beautiful. It was a beautiful experience. So I feel like the, even though the, the uh, judgment, of course, that was unfair, we knew that going there. <laughs> we, we knew that. We just, we wanted the opportunity to to fight internationally, gain experience, see what these girls are about in these other countries, put our face on the map get our name in the rankings, and that was it. And that's exactly what we did do. That's exactly what happened. Um, if anything, I do I do believe I was capable of a lot more, but I was still very young and still in a point in my career where, I, you know, I was playing possum. I was deadly, and I was I was just a really smart fighter. That was why um, <laughs> I didn't take much damage. I was just always a really smart tactical fighter. Well, I mean, I I agree. I think that you have an incredible ring IQ. Then it seems like this is the prime of your career, from the Anita Christensen fight to the the Mora Mosley card. This feels like, the, or really to the Ava Knight fight, this feels like the best Kalisha West that ever existed. But you go to Lima, Peru. 
and you stop Vanessa, I can't pronounce her last name, in five rounds. Was this, were you super confident going into that fight, having just gone to Denmark and beating a champion over there but not getting the decision? Were you just super confident uh, in your beliefs going into that fight? Where, which fight is this? Because it cut out right when you said. Uh, it says the Jockey Club in Lima. Vanessa. Oh, oh, so, okay, so this fight came about because Kina Mapartida, who is the world champion who beat, um, oh, my goodness, I forgot her name. She was the, the white girl from Brooklyn. Uh, she won 32 champion WBC. Oh, my goodness. Marie Shea. So she, Kina, Kina Mapartida had beat Marie Shea. Um, and won a world title in New York, and I was Kina Malpartida's number one sparring partner to get her ready for that fight. So when she won, she was like, thank you, Kalisha. I'm so grateful. I want you, you to go with me to Peru. And and she was a superstar, a, a, a superstar in Peru. And I'm talking about we couldn't go to the movie theater. She had to wear glasses, a beanie, and a, and a jacket to go to the movie theater. I'm talking about when we got off the airport, there was a line of fans. And there was a line of security having to t- block off the fans just to let us depart and or leave. It, it was crazy. And um, she was our first ever world champion boxer between men and women from their country. So she is history. She is their Peruvian history. And I was it was such a humbling experience to be invited to go. Um, so when we went, it w- it was any it wasn't even about um it wasn't even about like I, I don't want to say this, but it really wasn't about me. You know, she was defending her world title and, and it was about me being grateful that I had the opportunity to be on a card with her in her country and that she made sure the promoter she made the, sure that the promoter took care of me and my team. It was really, 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 really cool. Uh, Vanessa, I don't remember knowing much about her, but as long as I knew her height, at the time I was very confident. I've always been very confident in fighting female fighters or or just fighters in general that are shorter than me. I've always been really good at just beating the heck out of fighters that are shorter than me. I'll be honest with you. If you're shorter than me, I feel bad for you. I just, like a jigsaw puzzle, or you know, I just, freaking eight people alive that were shorter than me. I mastered it. I mastered the skill of shorter fighters. <laughs> shorter you just fighters knew that never distance kept... and range, and you kind of fight like a Tasmanian devil distance controller. So it's like, I get what you're saying. It is. I, I, felt, I truly felt that I can land any punch I wanted to with shorter fighters. I would land the uppercuts, the body shots, the head shots, the hook shots. Whereas taller fighters, you know, sometimes I I just couldn't reach. I didn't land the chin shot. You know, at the uppercut. I just it, it was really very it, uh, shorter fighters came e- easier to me. My and it, we knew that. My dad knew that since I was an amateur. You didn't like what I'm hearing is like you didn't have to worry about reaching for your punches. Like you have good distance engaging where you're at. And with a taller fighter, you had to kind of like at sometimes maybe sell out to try to land a strike or a punch. As opposed with a shorter fighter, you can just control where they're where they're at, kind of with lateral movement and a good stick. Well, taller fighters, I had to get hit to hit. With exactly. shorter fighters, I could hit, hit, and hit. <laughs> and that was it. You just you said it way more real than me. I said a whole lot of words, and you just said a whole lot of realness. Now, <laughs> I want to say this: uh, when you fought Angel. On the Sergio Morashe Mosley fight, I lived in Armenia at the time, and that fight card holds a special place in my heart because I actually woke up at like five in the morning to watch that whole fight card. I can't remember if I watched you fight, but I remember I knew who you were because it stood out that you were a women's bout, and I was like, "That's pretty cool." And like, I didn't know much about you. I didn't know even what your nationality was, to be completely honest. But I'm just like, "This is awesome." Like, I just hope she does well. So I just wanted to put that in there that this fight card really meant a lot to me in my life. So I just want you to know that. Thank you. 
Thank you. No, no worries. That's cool. That's cool to know. It's funny, you know, you don't know what's going on on the other side, you know, and when you hear that reminisce, it's pretty cool. Well, I think I think it's important to say that realness because maybe you were just grinding and you know, in like just a small circle of friends, but I think it's important for you to understand something you put work into impacted my life a lot, and I was somewhere else in the world. But this is the you won the WBO women's female bantamweight title and you won by knockout is this the greatest moment in your boxing career when you fought fought on this pay-per-view card oh you know it is gosh that's such a tricky question i know i gave you a tough one yeah the greatest moment in my career when i became it's funny because i'll be honest as an adult and as a mom that was the greatest moment in my career. But if I take myself back to that mindset of how I was when I was so driven, it, it wasn't. You know, if I'm bluntly honest with you, if I was the Kalisha West that won the title in 2010 at the Staples Center, that that to me was not the greatest moment in my career. Many different did, reasons. Many did different you know reasons. Keith Thurman, Frankie Gomez? Vic, uh, were also on that card with you? No, I did not. I think I remember, I just remember Sergio Mora and Shane Mosley. I had, and Danny, no, not, was it Frank? David Rodello? No, Frank Diaz? Frankie Diaz? Or? Frankie Gomez, the pit Gomez. Bull. Yes, the pit bull. I remember him <laughs> for the bad, for bad reasons. Why? Uh, yeah, I just wish... I wish, yeah, but um, that's for another day. But um, what do you remember about this? Because this is like you're basically an ambassador for women's boxing. You're getting an opportunity on a big card. You really uh, want me to be honest in this moment. <laughs> I, I want you to say whatever you feel. I, like, I, feel, this like is, yeah. the, I feel like the answer that, you know, if anyone who's listening to this is hoping to hear is not going to be what they're going to hear because – for, for you know, as an adult looking back, that is by far one of the greatest moments. I'm I'm so proud of that moment. But was it one of the greatest moments in my career? Absolutely not. Number one, um, we had someone on our team who was advocating for for me and women's boxing, who we we later didn't work with, um, but who kind of took over on the management side of of for that fight when it comes to like the purse expectations and so forth. I had to sell. 500 tickets for that fight. So you were and pimped out. I was pimped out. Yeah, I was pimped out. And and when I and, and this is what makes it worse is I sold 500 tickets with the promise of television. You'll be the swing bout. You'll you'll get televised. I was never televised. Um, and then and you probably got paid shit too. Twenty five hundred dollars. Two thousand five hundred dollars for a ten round fight. I made more in my six rounder. Um. But what was more disheartening was when I looked at the piece of paper to sign off for my check, and Frankie Gomez was above me, and his purse said seven thousand for a four or six rounder. I think it was. Nobody really knew him back then. He was just upcoming, not a big and name. But people he was still in, don't really know him. I hate to he, say, but yeah, but people. We're investing. The promoter was investing in him, and and I and and I understand from a political and a business side that you're not going to want to put any money into this this girl if you don't feel that girls girls sell, you know. And and if you're going to put money into these boys that you feel will sell, and you'll you'll make your money back. But the money was there regardless. It was there, and with TV, we were not allowed to come in with all these sponsors to make up for. You know the sponsor, the, uh, the the pay that I was getting. So it just I was really in an ugly predicament. And from from that young of an age, I I didn't feel like I was a champion, especially because after the fight, when Monica Sears grabbed me, Monica Sears was one of the helpers of Golden Boy Promotions, and I don't know if she's still there today. But this was when I was 20 years old, and I wasn't as vocal as I am today because I'm very vocal now, and I really don't I really don't care to speak about experiences like this. But but after my after my fight, when I had won, 
um, I remember being told, Please come here, hurry, get on, get on the plane, hurry, go. Okay, let's go. And it was such a rush moment, and I only got to say about five words, and I was rushed off the stage, and <laughs> hardly anyone clapped, just some of the media guys who knew who I was. But it was just, I felt so like nothing. I just, I felt like another number. I didn't feel like a champion, is what I'm trying to say. Um, and it's weird because I feel as if, as if like Golden Boy Promotions wanted me to kiss their butt and, and thank them so much for giving me this opportunity. But I paid $500 worth of tickets, okay? Let's do the math here. $50, and, the, and they were not all general admission tickets. Let's do the math. 500 times 50 is $25,000. I paid for my purse, her purse, and any sanction fees that may have been have had to be paid. And I paid them some money. So, no, it's not thank you, Golden Boy Promotion. It's thank you, Team West, for selling 500 tickets, for bringing in your audience you said you would, for winning spectacularly. But I didn't feel that. That's not what I felt. And even when I won, I didn't think like this. I never did the math back then. I just thought, okay, I won the title. All right, all right cool. And then I didn't feel anything afterwards. I didn't feel like a champion. I did from my fans, though. I did from Sugar Shane Mosley. I did from Jack Mosley. I did from Team Mosley and their family inviting me to their church and their speeches. I did from my people. I didn't from the boxing politics, though. I did not from the boxing promoters. I did not from the TV networks. I did not feel like a champion from the people who really counted and really mattered because I was a woman. Because if you look at my fight and if you look at, at, at a Frankie Gomez fight, if you look at any other fights, I fought a beautiful fight. I didn't look sloppy. I looked beautiful. I looked like a damn man in there punching, very precise, very quick, very fast, and then knocked her out cold to where she had to get stitches on her on her eyeball. And when she tried to get back up and walk, she was stumbling, and the referee stopped it. Made a good call. Made a very good call because I was going in for blood after that, I promise. Made a good call. So the fact, the fact are is, was it my most greatest moment in my career? Absolutely not. But is it my most memorable and one of my most proudest moments? Absolutely yes. You know, I will always, I will always remember that because that is technically what put me on the drawing board to become a world champion. After that, I never settled again for being disrespected as a, as a champion, never again. And that's why I was in Mexico, and that's why I fought in other countries afterwards. That's why I defended my title with these non-American promoters because in America they don't they didn't care about you back then. Oh, you're a world champion? Oh, but you're getting sanction fees. I'm sorry, we can't do it. <laughs> that was it. that was how it was. I couldn't even afford to be a champion. This group of kids did a documentary on me, and they called it an empty title. Followed me for like four years, uh, and in that in that uh, documentary is a beautiful documentary, hour long documentary of how it was being a female as a world champion. And it should have been taken to the film festival, um, but it wasn't because of a misunderstanding and miscommunication with these with these uh, form contracts that they wanted me and my dad to sign. I signed mine. My dad wouldn't sign his until he got it reviewed. But by then, they just got upset because they missed their film festival thing. So then they took the footage, ran with it. Never, I never got to see it again. I never got to see the documentary that followed me for so long. And that's a whole nother story. Whole nother beast. If you know him, reach out to him for me, man. Tell him well, if I, that if I ever, if there I there, ever there, run there. into him, I'll help you out. Trent, because... uh, what was their name? Uh, Trent Terrell and Jared Endress. Trent around it. Very nice guys. Very, very nice guys. Young kids. Now they're older. But there's no reason why they needed to hoard that footage, you know, and get upset like that. But that's what it was. It was whatever. Well, I mean, that's – so let's let's just finish off your career. So you rematch with Ava Knight after that. You're mm-hmm. not going to be disrespected. You're a world champion. You had that fight with Ava. You do the rematch, and – I feel like a lot of people feel that you won this fight. 
Oh, a lot of people. Somewhere in, 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 in Ava's deep, deep soul, she knows I won. Uh, I remember her. Uh, I remember her coach saying I won too afterwards. Coach and, uh, Ben. Yeah, Ben. Yeah, I remember him saying you got this one, but it was good, and you know how he is, how he talks. He said that too. Uh, of course. I know Ben say, very well. Yeah, yeah. Of course, when they say that, they might immediately regret it because they got a draw. But I know what he said. Let him know. Kay remembers what he said. He said, you got this one, but it was good. You know what I mean? But, you know, for that, I was very, very, very proud of my performance because I stuck to Kalisha. (laughs) I stuck to my game. I didn't get hit cold. I wasn't getting beat up. I wasn't getting snatched up like she got me that first fight. She got me that first fight. That second fight was all me. I had fun doing it. I was landing clean shots. And a lot of people who were there stood up and was like, "Yay, Kalisha, you do!" And they loved it because me and her were beautiful boxers. It looked like two dudes going in there. You know what I mean? Going in, two very as, skillful dudes. As someone that I'm hoping to be a historian or at least just a real individual that can help people with boxing history, I feel like you and Ava ushered in this new era of women's boxing. Like just to be genuine. Yeah. We, yeah, we, we did for the pros. We broke pairs. We we started letting a lot of promoters know we're out there. We're here. Hi. And we look damn good doing this. Hello. This ain't no uh, Layla Ali versus a 50-year-old uh, uh, mama with five kids and two fights. These are two women who have an amateur background and who's here to show you that we can fight and look just as good as men. That's what it was, and it was something still very new. And it was something that you don't see a lot of. You know, Christy Martin was someone who showed that type of a skill. But to have two competitive female fighters in the ring with each other, that fight should have been televised. Me and Ava's fight should have been televised. Cause if the world saw me and Ava fight, the world would have been a, a fan of, of women's boxing. It's just you've got two hard, hard-headed, hard-hitting, skillful boxing, fast females who are just, Angry to win, hungry to win, hearts of lions. That's what it was, you know. And it's beautiful when when those. It's like you know the talks of talks of of Lomachenko and and Davis. You know what I mean? Everybody wants to see those two hungry killers go at it. Well, this was happening for women. It was happening. That was that fight. That was a fight like that. I think about oh you never gotta be bad like you don't gotta ever trip off me I'm just a person but um, I think that like not to compare it but to compare it would be like the lower weights like 112 pound a lot of times people have been fighting the best fighters consistently but they just didn't get television and they were in Japan and it's like women's fighting why I follow women's fighting is you get a lot of really super fights because the money isn't there so if you want to do it you just have to find how you can make five ten fifteen grand or whatever it is it's the hardest fights and that's what i think the sad part is that nobody's been creative in marketing it because there is a market for it oh but but you gotta understand this was before instagram this was before twitter uh it was as big as it was this is when youtube just came out this was before smartphones were just as clear as they are you understand what I mean? So this is 2010, 2011. You take nine years away, you've got the iPhone 4, I believe. Yeah. And you don't have Etsy. You don't have Pinterest. You don't have uh, TikTok. You do not have these apps. And if you did have Instagram, Instagram just came out, I think, in 2012, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. And it was still just starting to become very popular. But I didn't have all that. I mean, today... You're not lying. Today, there's a market for it. There's a real market for it. Back then, you had to have something going for yourself. Back then, Layla Ali had the last name. Me and St. John had the Playboy cover. Christy Martin had to uh, come out to every De La Hoya fight, and there was really no, not many good fighters that during that time that could even face her. You know what I mean? Lucia Riker will face the dude. So you had to have something that – that rode along with your name of how you marketed yourself whenever you had the marketing um, um, the marketing um, opportunity. But today, you could be hardly anybody 
hardly good, but if you have one hell of a marketing behind you using a geotag and a hashtag in the appropriate time in the appropriate location with the appropriate person in the appropriate position, you will become a verified account where a verified account looks like you're really official, looks like you're great. All of a sudden, you're on Instagram looking like you're one of the greatest female fighters out there because of a little blue check mark. My account has no blue check marks, and I can tell you, I could be, I could, when I was boxing, I could beat half the girls' asses who got check marks. You know what I mean? So it, it, it's a totally different world as far as marketing. It's so influential. It's so, um, it's all about an image now. It's all about a photo. It's all about a short clip. You know, you could be a sorry fighter, but you got one short clip of you throwing an uppercut. Oh, my gosh, this girl's amazing. Where is she? She's the best female fighter I've ever seen. So the, the game is totally different from when I was amateur and my early pro days. And it did start changing to the very end when I was already, my heart was already snatched. You know, when I fought Ava, I didn't get paid for that fight. When I rematched Ava Knight, I didn't get paid because you know why? She wanted a lot of money because she knew it was a tough fight. She knew it was a world title fight. And I had to pay sanction fees. So I had to give up my purse in order to defend the title. And if I didn't fight her and no one else wanted to fight me, they were going to strip me of my title. And not only that, but I had just come off from a car accident nine months prior where I had whiplash and I was bed rest for two months. So, you know, under those type of circumstances, when you're selling 500 tickets, when you ain't getting televised, you ain't getting paid, you keep on fighting, you keep on winning, you keep on doing what you're supposed to do, but you still don't get any love, you ain't the same fighter that you were when you had your pro debut against Susanna Warner in, at, at San Manuel Casino. You are not the same person. I was not the same person toward the end of my course. Well, it sounds like life had beaten you up. And it's like now you're Fox politics. Um, yeah. Like it's just like the just like the adversity you faced. So it's like now you're kind of just burnt out because you came in naive, young, wanting to be the best and people had either taken advantage or um wrong wrong things had happened or lies or you've gotten let down because people said things and then it doesn't happen. And it's like at a certain point you lose hope or at least yeah. I do. Mm -hmm. Oh no, that was absolutely it. Absolutely. So when you go to Mexico, you have three fights. Um, what was the Mexico? Is that just kind of like an F you to the American fighter, the American promoters, and you're just kind of fighting, but you're also just, what's this stage in your career? No, so that was more of a, we were approached by Hector Garcia that they wanted to promote us. So we signed with Hector Garcia, and he did. He did promote us. We're not asked by any American promoter to sign with them. We were never asked for <laughs> Sign with an American promoter, it was unheard of back then. So when when a Mexican promoter and you've got Jackie Nava and, and Ana Marie Torres on the cover of Mexican People magazine coming at you, it's a given. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, do you want to stay in America and make twelve dollars an hour, or do you want to go to Europe where they pay you thirty two an hour and you're respected and they love you and you're treated how you should be treated based on your work ethic and your and your um <laughs> and your resume? That's all they did. They treated you like they treated me like my resume. They treated me how my resume was, how I should have been treated. So that was why we made the decision to go to Mexico and sign with them, you know. And so and you have two fights. You fought um, Claudia Lopez and Jessica Villafranco. Uh, yeah, I thought I fought another one, but Christina yeah. Ruiz was uh, uh, in October of that year, but that was in Pomona. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Never mind. Shout out yeah, Sugar Free. Right, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. But um, do you remember anything about this, like, era or anything? Um, I remember how beautiful it was going to Mexico and how the people would tell me to bring Justin Bieber there as if I was someone so famous. <laughs> uh, I loved I loved going to Mexico and fight. I had some of the most beautiful experiences. Manzanillo, Mexico, Colima, all over there. I saw beautiful iguanas. I was chilling with, you know, at times I was chilling with a, 
Anna Marie Torres, and you know, she is just the women out there were not looked at as the sex symbols. They were looked at as that's my Aztec warrior. That's my woman. That's my strong woman. My woman's strong. It was very, it was very respected. It was very well respected. You don't have to be half naked to be respected. If you have a world title. The boxing industry in Mexico was just, you know, it was a, it was a country sport, you know, I mean, it was, it was a supported sport of the entire country. So man, male or female, if you were a champion in their eyes, you are amazing. And I felt it from the people, you know, in America, when I fought, I could see who can, who, who viewed me as a champion and who viewed me as just a woman in a man's sport. I felt it in the weigh-ins. I felt it in the press conference. I felt it during and after the fight. And it, and it, it, was, it, it really was a prejudice. And you so you felt the sexism. You felt oh, like... Absolutely. absolutely. I felt it with their eyes. I felt it with their demeanor. I felt it with their actions. And a lot of people followed the crowd of the people. A lot of people didn't agree, but they still followed the, mo- the momentum. Think about it. If you have a, a, a James Tony, or no, I'm sorry, let me say something else, a, a Tommy Hearn standing there, but then you have the female version of the Tommy Hearn standing right next to him, but then you see the way the crowd reacts towards Tommy Hearn compared to the female version of Tommy Hearn, who are you going to get in line to get your autograph signed by? Honestly, it's sociology, it's ethics, it's a social study. The majority of the people will follow the crowd of others, and that's what I felt in America. As a female, because it wasn't popular and it wasn't getting respect and it wasn't well known and it wasn't being publicized and it wasn't being promoted and, it, and nobody cared for it, that's what everybody just knew. It was embedded in them. They just that's what they followed. But in Mexico, oh, I felt the love. I felt the respect before, after, during press conference, weigh in, fight, pre fight, after fight. Visiting days after the fight, it, I felt the love so much that I got my car washed right outside of the border, and I had five of the men who worked at the car wash place that barely spoke English run up to me and ask for my autograph. We just saw you on Telemundo. You know, that's how much respect Mexico has for, for fighters in general, not just men. It's very beautiful. I love it. You could have, If you could headline anything, you could headline my Mexican people. Let them know I love fighting in Mexico. I love representing Mexico. Absolutely. So I've always wondered this for six years of my life. I looked up your fight when you fought in Canada. I didn't see this fight, but I remember I was in, like, Germany at the time. No, I was in Prague. Man, I'm just sounding like a fucking world traveler when I'm referencing this shit. But (laughs) the honest to God truth, I'm not trying to, to, like, name drop cities, but in Prague, and I saw you lost, and I go, what the heck? How did Kalisha lose? Like, she's good. Like, what happened? Like, you're off a two-year layoff. So I've always wanted to ask you this. What yeah. happened in this fight? Because you're like, not to say you're better than the girl that beat you, because in, in fairness to the girl, she did beat you, but I view you as way better than the girl that beat you. Well, there was a lot that went on for this fight that a lot of people don't know that happened behind the scenes that I'm ashamed of even talking about. And I don't care to talk about it now because I'm older and I'm over it. But, yeah, but I've never talked about it to anyone. And, number one, she wasn't who I was supposed to fight. She was a lot bigger. Her legs, her body. She fought me at St. John and beat me at St. John. So she had over 30-something pro fights. She was a tough – she was a tough girl, but I easily – I easily could beat her. And I'll tell you what, I beat her that fight. I'll honestly say today, it's available online. You can watch it. I'll find the link. I'll send it to you. I beat yeah, her. Send it to me. I beat her. I beat her in that fight. But I'll start from the beginning. I beat her. I beat her when I was at a C, a C, average C plus performance of Kalisha West. And I still beat her. And I know I beat her. And the reason why I say that is because, well, that I was a C performance was because, number one, my father's only mother figure he ever had in his life had died. She died She died before the fight. And he, he wasn't in the right mind. I had to train a couple times with other trainers, and 
I was going through a really rough breakup with someone who was suicidal. It was a very abusive relationship. It was very toxic. And I had I wasn't sleeping at all. And when I did sleep, was the only time I did sleep was because I was taking the same prescription medication that was prescribed to me for my old root canal a long time ago uh, called hydro, hydro, hydrocodone or it's Norco. It's a, it's a generic name for Norco. I was taking Norco uh, to sleep so often that I wasn't even performing in the gym like I should be. I wasn't even in the right mind, in the, physically in the right state to even fight. It showed up in my blood test. My doctor had to sign me a waiver and say it was related to my root canal because it was my own prescription, but I should not have been taking it. The pain from my root canal wasn't there, but I was taking it to sleep. I was going through a hell of a lot. And during that time of everything, all that crap that happened, I went in there and we weren't supposed to fight this girl, but the other girl couldn't get her visa passport uh, situation going. So we fought her. And in the first round, I knocked her down with a jab. She ran right into it, and she fell flat on her ass. And they didn't give me an A count. They called it a slip. Now, prior to that, when I was in the corner to come out, the they were going to have me come out second. <laughs> I mean, because the champion comes out second. And <laughs> they stopped the event. The officials stopped the event and said, what are you doing? In their French accents, because they spoke French. What are you doing? She's not from Canada. She comes out. She's American. She comes out first. She's a contender. And they said, but she's the champion. And they said, no, not here. (laughs) So (laughs) I went in the heart of French, Quebec, where I wasn't the political favorite. I wasn't the fan favorite. I wasn't the favorite favorite at all. I wasn't, you weren't even I Canadian. Wasn't, I wasn't even Canadian. I wasn't, so I wasn't one of them. I wasn't one of them. So she was from Canada and and, and, and Canadian. I didn't have sh- nothing in my hands, nothing in my pocket, nothing going for me. And I still knocked her down in the first round because she walked right into it. And then the rest of the fight, she ran in with her big old head and head butt the hell out of me. But she never hit anything. She was sloppy as hell. And I kept uh, boxing her and landing the shots. But if you watch the fight, even you will see the fatigue in me. You, even you will see. You'll see. Wow, Kalisha was different. But I still beat her. I'll send you the fight. So, so I forgot. Was that a draw? That was a loss, huh? Yeah, that was a loss. That was a loss. <laughs> yeah, and, and I don't even – you know what? I don't ever even talk about that fight because I know it wasn't a loss and I know I didn't lose. I know I didn't lose that fight. So I don't even mention it. People say, what's my record? I won loss. I know I lost that first fight versus Ava. I know damn well I didn't lose that fight versus Olivia. I know I didn't. But it did take a lot. It took a lot for me for a lot of reasons because did I lose? No. But could I have done better? Absolutely. You understand what I'm saying? No, I get I get exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Um, it's a fighter knows when they've won or lost. That's it. That's it. I do. Well, not all. <laughs> I'll know about Juan Manuel Marquez. <laughs> well, I mean, Marquez had his He's gimmick right. where he put the the sombrero on, goes to the locker room, and complains. That's kind of like the Marquez <laughs> move. It's like he'd, he'd lose, puts the sombrero on, doesn't stay, yeah. and then he does the backstage <laughs> interview with right, stuff right. saying, I thought I totally won. Yeah. I mean, the only one Marquez, I think – did win the um, people is when he fought that Norwood guy because I've watched that fight so many times as a kid mm-hmm. and I don't see that guy beating Marquez but I could be just like looking at it all wrong and stuff but, yeah yeah no I I like that especially when Tim Bradley beat him and he was just like shocked and it's like yeah. okay but um we you get your farewell fight you beat Christy Simmons um. I guess I got some final questions and people are blowing up my phone, but I've always wanted to do kind of this retrospective on your career because I've always respected you a lot. And I thought you brought a lot to the sport. First off, what do you want people to remember your career as? 
I I would like people to remember me as one of the greatest female fighters, both inside and outside of the ring. I was charismatic. I was beautiful. I was amazing. I was fast. I was I, I was very well. I wasn't just another pretty face. You know, I was actually really, really, really good, and I was definitely one of the greatest female boxers that's ever boxed. I look at how great I was in my videos and my footage, and even I look at myself like, gosh, man, I was so damn good. <laughs> I was just so skillful. I was by far one of the most skillful female boxers, period. I don't care what anyone has to say. No, in, in your prime, you were a special fighter. Like, you yeah. were a special fighter. And the the problem is we see it with this, the Black Lives Matter protests right now. America is a place that isn't fair, whether it's oh. about the color of your skin or if you're a woman. There's a lot of hurdles that are put in place. And I think the sad thing for you is – um, the the planes are built on the backs of the pioneers. And what I mean is there's a lot of dead bodies that the legends walk over because people like yourself made the path for them to see where you're supposed to walk. And oh, I just absolutely. don't like that people don't always remember people like you. Not at all. Not at all, yeah. Absolutely. You're, and a lot of female boxers today who are verified accounts and, and, and they have a great following and good for them. I'm happy for them. And they don't mention how great of a fighter someone like myself was. And they won't, you know, because they, they, they're just so focused on themselves. And I can't blame them. You know, when, you, when you're in a sport like this, they don't show you no love. You got to get love where you can get it. You just kind of don't even mention all that. But ultimately, you're absolutely right. We're the dead bodies that's being walked on. And it's, it's sad that it's that way, but it is. So, I mean, if anything... I, can't change what's happening you know you can only just be proud of what's going on and what changes have been made today you know what i'm saying so it's kind of the way i've been i look at it now i take it as a grain of salt and what's your greatest moment in your career um let's see you know what you want to know the truth my greatest moment was my three seconds of fame on the Apple Music release commercial because the 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 producers this there's two, both that and the Sony. And this is why though, this is why. Because the producers respected women's fighting so much that they were like, What do you what do you do? You you tell me what to do on the set. Okay, well you just show me. Is that how you do it? Right on and the, and it was beautiful. It was beautiful that I felt like my hard work was recognized. I was scouted, and I was on – my face was – even if it was three seconds, my face was on Nash, uh, worldwide television during one of the um, – what do you call it when the soccer championships are going on? During – The World Cup? Yeah, during the World Cup. My The commercial that I was on was – Pharrell, when they released Apple Music, I was on the Apple released music commercial as a boxer, as someone who was strong. And with that song by Pharrell that goes, uh, Freedom, I love it. I loved it. You know, because the, the song that Pharrell made called Freedom, the meaning behind the song and then the, the, the diversity of the commercial and being a part of that, all because I was a world champion boxer, I had that opportunity. That to me, was one of the most greatest moments of my of my boxing career, and I got to box. I was able to fight. I shared that with Kristen Morales, who's another uh, boxer out there who is really an amazing fighter. And it was just really cool. I felt that very respected in America. That's what I want you to highlight, though. It was well, one of my greatest. That's moments. What I was it was say. one of my greatest moments because it was in America, and I never got that type of attention being a female boxer in America in my entire career. And what was what was the one thing that I said in the very beginning of this conversation? I was driven to have the world know and see my face and know who I am as an amazing boxer. That's what I said. So when I had that, you know, three seconds of fame in Amer- on American TV, to me, that was everything. It may not have displayed a whole fight. It may not have displayed all of my talent, but it was a quick combination that people got to see my face, and it was beautiful to me. It was very beautiful. Beautiful moment. Well, I was just going to kind of wrap this up and just say when I've talked to you and had this conversation, 
the big thing is respect. You Absolutely. always wanted respect because you put a lot of time into this and you didn't want to just be a sexualized figure. You wanted to be looked at as a combatant, a boxer who has skill, who's someone that people respected, that isn't Absolutely. just a female person that guys are going to hit on. Absolutely. And that commercial, amazing. because like, I feel like that's, especially the era you grew up in, I'm sure sexual harassment and sexism was rampant. And that probably made you the tough person that you are. But it feels like respect is the key thing with you. Absolutely. That was my biggest thing. That was one of my biggest battles is the fact that I wouldn't sell out for wearing a bikini and a thong and, you know, posing half naked or anything. I wouldn't, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't lose my dignity. And I'm so glad I didn't do it (laughs) because if my son grew up and saw that on the internet, I'd be very upset and disappointed. And disappointed myself if he ends up marrying a woman who felt she needs to feel she needs to do that for her body and I can't even preach about it because I was one of them <laughs> you know what I mean <laughs> so I, I'm absolutely uh satisfied with my image of who I, who I represented myself as uh, and it, was, it wasn't a sex symbol it was a boxer as it was a professional world champion boxer nothing more nothing less well, I will finish this by saying I've always respected you, but get, talking and going through your career, I respect you even more. And I'm, I just respect <laughs> you, you so much for doing this. And I respect you for the fact that you remembered little old me when I first got started. And you said the nicest thing, like, well, now you're big time. I ain't no big time person. <laughs> just the same, but if, if you're still doing what you love, you're big time. You, if you're still doing it that long, later, years later, that's big time to me. 